This is where we used to play football as kids. Now, it wasn't like this, obviously. The walls were in place, but there was a green here in the middle. And in the green in the middle is where we used to always play. We obviously used to use, see the, the, the Pied Pipers, the men there, the playing the instruments. They were actually the goals we used to use. So if you hit the flute or the fiddle, it was a goal. Once it hit anywhere in the black area, it was a goal. So we used to play World Cup off that, where there might be five or six lads out here uh, playing in the green. Whoever be in goals, they kick the ball out and we just whack away. And we could be here for like five or six hours during the day. I remember coming home from the, the World Cup in Italy in 1990, obviously, and having all you know the experience of going to the, to the Ireland-Italy game. And, it was just football, football, football the whole summer and when we came back I remember the, the manager then was Walter McNulty and I was only I think eight or nine at the time and he had heard that, that I was a lad that was interested in football and he, he brought me in and obviously uh, he, his assistant, my now father-in-law Paddy Henry, were the two men in, in charge and obviously I went in there and the rest is history really. So many of us grow up watching support and rovers going to games. And for many people, if they got the chance to play for to play one match for, for Cyborg's team, come on for a minute, they'd say, Jesus, they, they live the dream, so to speak. But I don't think there's many players in, in any level of football who can say they did what Raft did. It was fitting that Raft done it that day. He lived all our dreams that day. You know, it's, that's any Rovers fan just thinks about that moment where they win the league for Sligo Rovers. And Raf lived it and he couldn't have done it in any better way. And I couldn't think of a better person to have done it either because he lived Sligo Rovers. October 13 was like Christmas morning waking up full of excitement and joy for the day ahead. So we met in my parents' house as normal, walked down with my dad, brothers, nieces and nephews, headed into Moonies for one and you could feel the excitement grow there. Being, I suppose, around age 10 in primary school in the build up to the game, the excitement was immense. A lot of us were actually going to the game with those big interests in our class in Sligo Rovers and uh, a lot of us were part of the Super Red so we were anticipating the game highly. The build up for the game against Pats was, it was, you know, the buzz around the town, seeing the temporary stand gone in and, and everyone scrambling to get tickets, knowing that if we win this at home, this is the title. And everyone, the whole talk was it hasn't been won in 36 years. And, it was just, for me, it was difficult because you missed out on the buzz, but I was excited. And you're there, you're going in the dressing room, you see the lads, you're, you're, just, you're just as nervous as them. But knowing that you're more, nearly more nervous because you know you can't do anything about it. It's out of your hands. It was great buzz. You could hear little snippets all over O'Connell Street, Castle Street, Wine Street. We're going to do it. This is our year. We're going to win the league. So I decorated my window here, decorated the mannequins, put up the flags. Everything became red and white. Even as a as a ten year old walking into the showgrounds that day, I think you got a sense of how uh, monumental the day was going to be for the club. I mean, 35 years since they had last won it, it was a brilliant occasion. Nerves, just pure nerves. I couldn't I couldn't get my head around what was possibly going to happen that day, and getting tickets, the excitement of getting the tickets organised and ringing me out lad and my brother and telling them I've got the tickets for the game after coming down here to the showgrounds and picking them up and you know the, the day is just leading up and going through every scenario what can happen that day is it going to come down to a 98 minute winner could we lose it that day and then having the possibility to go on and continue the, the stress of will we won't we but uh, no it was nerves and then I suppose a little bit of excitement when it finally came to it. The build-up around the town was massive and they were close to us. Like if they had a beat us, they could have probably caught us. Um, but I think everybody just focused on it. And You know, we, you could see in training that week, we were working on the tactics about we were squeezing up man for man, stopping them playing out, you know, an excellent Pats, St. Pat's team. Some very good players in it, the likes of Christy Fagan, and Ian Birmingham. I think Conor Kenna was there as well. Uh, Chris Forrester at the time. Excellent, excellent team. Set out brilliantly by Buckley, who was a real, how would you put it for him back then? He was a, a wee bit ahead of the time in terms of how he had teams, in this league especially, how he had teams playing football. I think the only one that had come close to him then was Paul Cook. They were the two leading lights in the league then, and they've, they developed the league, in my opinion, in how the style of play developed throughout the league and how teams started to play football the right way. But Buckley especially, he had that team playing excellent football. 
that season. So I know there's so many good players throughout the team, but if you're not set up properly, it won't work. Um, when I moved to Belgium first, uh, they were a very, very good team. It was the best club team I'd had was in my whole career. They passed it quite well, better understanding about the group, played with 3-5-2 on that team. They were excellent. Got to the semi-final of the UEFA Cup that year. Uh, Real Madrid were playing uh, Neuchatel Zamax and Cologne from Germany were playing our team from Belgium, Oregon. But really a fantastic footballing team. They passed it really well. It was more by design than by chance. It did influence my coaching career going forward. I did want teams to pass and play. If you look at it now, you look at the, the benchmark now of Man City's and your Bayern Munich's and all these top teams, they all pass and link it in particularly well. And it is the way forward. Cookie and Barraclough are two completely different characters, uh, both that I respect an awful lot. I think it's been said before that if you combine the two of them, you'd probably have the world's greatest manager. So when Ian came in, the team obviously had been assembled, but we still needed someone to manage us. I think you have to give an awful lot of credit to Ian that when he came in, he didn't make too many changes. He knew the team was there already capable of possibly winning a league. But what he did was he managed us and he coached us really well. Organised, you know, and any teams that have success are organised, particularly when they're out of possession, you know, the kind of way that they don't cough up too many chances. Um, but one of the big strengths Sligo had, not unlike St. Pat's at the time, was they had good players. They had a lot of good players. Uh, like when I look at Christy Fagan and some of the guys we've spoken about from Pat's, but equally when you're looking at your Joseph and Doe's and these type of guys, or Mark Quigley's, Jason McGuinness, these guys, they were all really good players. You know, kind of, they've all had tremendous success in their own careers. And what a wonderful job that the Sligo Rovers Club have done in the last six months or so to transform this venue. Yeah, we got here very early, I suppose, because we wanted to get our seats, we wanted to get our programmes, we wanted to get settled into it. And it was myself and my father that came that day, and we just wanted to absorb the atmosphere. And I wanted to take it in with him especially because, as I said, from going as a child, we've been to every game together. And just the hype that was gathered, the more people that gathered. We got there so early that we nearly watched the, the stand fill up. And that was a wee bit surreal as it unfolded. You know, you only saw it in the European games, not really in league games just watching everyone come in and everyone was buzzing. This ground has been transformed, Stephen. The, the, the physical aspect of this football club is quite a pleasure to behold. The atmosphere, as the lads have said, is quite magnificent at the moment. The sense of expectation around this town is almost palpable. And they've waited a long, long time for this. Have the players now got the nerve to deliver the most important prize? Everything was set for that. We have a full house. They didn't come to see us bring the league to another week in Jordan. They come for one thing, winning here in the showground. Most of the fans here expectant and waiting for this title for a very long time. And here they come and listen to the applause. Standing ovation around the stadium. That far stand was full well over an hour ago. The Force Rover I think was set up by the likes of Sean Murta and, and a few other guys in about 2008 um, who did brilliant stuff like in terms of making the banners and stuff and I suppose for myself was the big thing is to be in amongst the chant. I know a lot of the, the other lads would have been uh, the artistic guys or whatever else. I myself was shouting and chanting was my big thing you know trying to get uh, Red Arms going or take me home church road whatever it could be going that was obviously you know that was my side of things I suppose and contributing to, to the atmosphere etc. So I played left back, so the Forza boys would always be beside me and, you know, be shouting Dav, giving me the, the football back for throw-ins, like, so we used to always be then, especially with the Shamrock Rovers game, something of what kind of uh, flags and what they had flares and what they had ready, like, so they were a real massive part of it uh, in that area, you know, because away from the stand, especially when I was a left back, so to, to keep me going during games. And it's Sligo Rovers in their all red strip against St. Pat's in their change strip today of navy blue with the lighter blue sleeves. And what a game we have in prospect. Sligo Rovers against St. Pat's with the league title at stake. Excited to win the league. Like, going out, looking at, looking at their team now and a good team. But the team we had, I was very confident with. So I felt we'd win the league today. And with the fans, there were so many fans there. The place was packed, the atmosphere, the pitch was perfect, the weather was perfect, the cameras were there. It was, it was, I felt it was meant for us to win it that day. I think the group really knew that they were going to go and win it, a league title, I think, in 2012. Uh, 
you know, we had won the, the obviously the cup in 2011, you know, 2010 before that. And I think the next progression was 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 the league. And I think in 2012, Cookie had gotten all the lads he wanted to get. When Barra came in, he got the one or two lads he wanted to get as well. So. You know, for me, I think, and not only me, I think the group, the whole group knew that we were going to go and, and, and win the league. And everyone, I think, from the start to finish had the bit between the teeth. The focus was now on that league, I think. I think we got knocked out of the cup early that year against Monaghan. All the focus was on the league. We'd been close the years before, and I think we all just felt that that was it. And the, the, I suppose the quality that was brought in, as you said, the likes of Mark and uh, Danny Nord and Gary Rogers. Um, that little bit of quality, I think, got us over the line. There was an expectation that we were going to win on the Saturday and romp home to the league, but with Rovers, nothing is ever guaranteed. And probably going back, thinking of that 2009 Cup final, where and then we obviously had success in 2010 and 2011, but we went to a 20, 2009 Cup final thinking we just have to turn up and sing the over. We all know that that's not what happened. So even though we were expecting to win the league against Pat on a Saturday, the atmosphere is that kind of nervous excitement, but it's kind of tapered with that kind of, let's not mess this one up either on the same way, you know. And the Sligo crowd acknowledge their team. It's a great football time. They've been denied by Sporting Fingal. They'll be back for more, you can be sure. The Sligo are terribly unlucky, I have to say. I must say that because I'm the manager. Listen, but just, I think it was 10 minutes to go, wherever it was, maybe 10 or 15 minutes to go. Uh, we just made one quick change, uh, just juggled it a wee bit, got lucky, and we've gone on to win it. Now, it was a spectacular win from our point of view because we'd beaten Bray Wanderers, who were decent at the time, and we'd beaten Shamrock Rovers in the quarterfinals, so it, was a, it wasn't an easy pathway through to it. Um, but you need a little bit of luck, and please God, and thankfully we got it. Well, the first year that I was chair, we lost in 2009 to Sporting Fingal, and I always felt after that that maybe we were short a player, Raf got injured. I was actually treating his shoulder under the stand when the penalty went in for Finn Gaul. And I always remember thinking if we'd had one more player, it would have been different. And the following year, I the absolute fortune to meet Joseph and Doe and sign him. And he had a belief and ability and a charisma that is just very, very difficult to describe. He's as impressive a man as I've met in my life. And we brought Joe in and then the following year we won the League Cup 2010, we won the FAI Cup, we retained it the following year, won the League the following season, another cup, one in Satant and one in Europe. So we had a huge run of success. And after the first win in 2010, the Town Hall in Sligo always said the challenge would be to win the next one. Because over the history of Sligo Rovers that point, we'd never put two trophy winning seasons back to back. I really believe if Billy had won in 78, if they'd beaten Shamrock Rovers, we'd have gone on to be at the top for a long time. And in many ways, that was the challenge to sustain it. And thankfully we did, and I'm no doubt it'll come back again. The pitch here today is absolutely perfect. It'll suit the ground football that Pats play and the fast-moving football Sligo play. I still come back to the great players across the park. Very little to please be pick between the two teams. I think it will be nerves that will decide. I didn't say a few words to Candle. Uh, I say a few words <laughs> to tell them what's going to happen if we don't win. <laughs> Because, okay, in, in, my, in my mind was, this season, we beat everyone except some parts. I don't want to win the league without win, uh, beating them. No way. No way. So for me, it was a challenge to say, that's the only team we didn't win against. That's the first thing. The second thing is, there is no way someone can give me a guarantee that if we don't win there, we're going to win against Goda. No way. So I just said, listen, we go, we're going to have to win the league here in Sligo in front of our fans. Not in Goda. We don't have a choice. So we can feel our stress or pressure. It doesn't matter. But that's the only game we have to win. Just as the first ball was kicked, it kind of settled in nearly straight away. And Maybe a wee bit too confident to be honest with you. <laughs> so it was, but no, I settled into the game quite easily. I'm watching it. I wasn't too stressed after the first wee while, but. Being in the stand, I definitely had an element, I suppose, of jealousy. I would have loved to have been out there, but the 
fact it's a league and we're all in it together, all I wanted to do was win. So I had the feeling like a fan, you know, I had goosebumps like anyone. And I was just really looking forward to watching a good game of football. That's trying to settle. Sligo pressing them very high up the pitch. Birmingham clears away. Piers into the back of Christy Fagan, making sure he knows he's there. And Lee Lynch sends it forward, but Brown has time. This familiar back four for St. Pat's. O'Brien, Kenna, Brown and Birmingham. Joey, when he was in the game, was like our lieutenant or general. So even when he's not touching the ball, he's controlling everything that's going on. So if we were to lose jo Joey at that time with the Bulger tackle, you know, who knows what would have happened. Yes, and they will need Joseph's experience and his creative powers. You don't want him hobbling around. We see it happening here, accidental. I thought that was gone. Like, I went off, and then uh, Barra asked me to try to run a little bit. So I tried a little bit, and I felt, oh yeah, it's, it's okay. But I really thought that he, I was, he was off. But I, I wasn't worried, because I knew that Jay going to dictate that game. We will not just launch the ball, for, but, and he start passing from the back. I think most of Sligo Town that grew up in that era would say Joey is the best footballer they have, they have seen. Um, and he was pivotal to the success of, of, Sligo, of Sligo Rovers. Well, we travelled out to Poltova, which is about 600 miles in the far side of Kiev, and we got 1970s bus over to play a Europa League game. Cookie was managing, and we were in the dressing room getting ready to go out. And Cookie said a few words and there was maybe 20,000 people there and the 100 loyal Sligo fans. And Cookie asked Joseph to speak. And I was in the dressing room, I was the chairman, I was the club doctor, I was doing everything to keep the cost down. And Joseph got up as we were getting ready to leave the dressing room and he said there's many forms of bravery. Making a tackle, running back, putting your head in. But he said the greatest form of bravery is the bravery to believe in yourself, to make a mistake, to give the ball away and keep showing for the ball, keep believing in your ability to do it. And it was just a magical moment for anyone who was there. And it sums up in many ways what life is about and what Rovers is about. And if for all the time there, it was worth it for that one inspirational moment from him. I'm lucky enough in my job that Joseph has, has come up to the school that I work in and has volunteered and put hours of his own time in, you know, voluntarily, because he loves football so much. And he loves seeing football played the right way. And I mean, that's probably what makes Sligo Rovers, Sligo Town, this whole area kind of special in that regard. You know, that a, a guy like Joseph, who is a phenomenal footballer, and a great person, the nicest guy you could meet. But wanting to stay in Sligo and contribute back to help younger generations achieve the same as, as he did, or put them on that path. And I think that's, it's a testament to Joseph and Sligo. And you talk about lasting impacts, you've got guys that grow up playing football that want to emulate that. I don't know what more of an impact someone can have. The main thing for me was to enjoy myself. The most pleasing things for me in my career is uh, that I keep that uh, uh, child-minded when it comes to football. It's just enjoy, enjoy. Don't let yourself uh, overtaken by the, by the event. It can be a big game, it can be a, f a friendly game. It's just the same, it's football and you have to enjoy. Because the, the one thing you have to understand also is that Football is like a therapy. Every time you're on the pitch, you know, you don't think about anything else. Uh, when you're in training ground, you don't think about uh, what's going on around you. You just focus on um, doing what you're doing, uh, developing your skills, and it, it just free your mind. I was confident, yet yeah, if, if it was on or the fancy there or the shield boots were on for, for a good few seasons um, and I, I, no, I wasn't afraid to take a shot anywhere. Halfway line, 40 yards, my half. If, listen, if it's on, for me in my mind, probably for other players that are thinking, no, I'll we'll just do it to play it safe, but you know, there's no, what's the, what's the risk and reward? You know, that, that sort of thing. It's, 
it's nice to score a goal from the halfway line or from 40 yards, you know, instead of passing out wide and getting in the box or whatever. But no, it wasn't like a greedy player. I chanced my arm a few times, anybody from, from range. Quigs, what do I, where do I start? Um, look, for me, probably one of the best players I've shared a pitch with or a dressing room with, you know. I was lucky enough to have shared a, a dressing room before that I, at Bowes with him, but, you know, for me, just his, his talent, you know, I remember in training, he'd be getting the ball on the halfway line, we'd be doing a bit of shape, and he'd drop in as a false nine, and he'd get it on the half turn, get it out of his feet, and bang, straight over the keeper's head from the halfway line, you know, and he'd be doing that regularly in training, you know, he, he, was, such, he was a special player, you know, he just, he, he knew, you know, he was so confident, you know, in his own ability, that no matter what happened, it wouldn't phase him. When you have someone like uh, Mark Hughley, who has eyes behind his back. So even he's looking this way, we are making one there because we know he's going to create something <laughs> to play that one there. So we have that different uh, uh, option on our game. Ross Gaynor, the one to strike the free kick. Wonderful strike. Did it just touch off the outside edge of the post? That was a brilliant effort by Ross Gaynor. Ross Gaynor had an, one of the nicest left foot probably I've, I've ever seen, you know. He had a lovely cultured left foot. We always, you know, when he played higher up the pitch, now he played left back come the, the end of his, his, his Sligo career, but when he played further up the pitch, I remember we used to always say, as soon as he got the ball, we knew. We knew he wasn't going to try and beat his player. He was getting it out of his feet and he was using the, the right back as a guide to guide it in around uh, between the keeper and the and the centre back. He had that ball to a tee and uh, I think Danny North scored a numerous amount of goals that season from, from balls from him coming in from wide areas, you know. Here's Joseph and Doe. Nice ball over the top, looking for Millen. Brown was backing. Lynch with the shot. Quality player actually just did my uh, UEFA B badges with him. So when he arrived, he had a brilliant season with Drogheda. But he came in, he was technically gifted, could score a goal, and he's gone on to have a brilliant career since Ligo as well. Chambers beaten in the air by Ventre. Good play by Lynch to Millen. Clever ball in, Quigley's there. Wonderful block by Conor Kenna. It was touch and go for the first wee while, but I think after about 15 minutes, we got a grasp on the game. We started to apply a wee bit of pressure. Had a couple of chances, half chances now, but but there were chances all the same. Quigley's effort got the crowd on their feet. And now Ger O'Brien looking for Fagan. Sean O'Connor chests it down to Fagan. Chance here. Forrester on the right. Fagan goes for goal. I played with Gary Rogers in Galway United. He came in, he probably had a Gaelic background as well. So, you know, he's a brilliant shot stopper, but he was brilliant at coming out for crosses, very physical. And so when he joined us with already a decent enough back four, I think success again, I was going to say, is around the corner. But even when Gary has gone on to do after Sligo, I think he's the most successful player to ever play League of Ireland, or one of anyways. Simple pass to Forrester. Fagan trying to find a pocket of space in the middle. Cut out by McGuinness, but back to Chambers again. Over the top for Bulger. And the tackle from Danny Ventre, who spotted the run and was there to snuff out the threat. He probably doesn't get the, the recognition as then flair players, but for us as defenders, stopping the passes, getting into the front man, breaking up attacks. We see that, maybe the fans might somewhat see that kind of the dirty side of the, of the game, as I say, but if you made a mistake, <laughs> Teddy Ventry was, he was remind me of looking at, say, like a Roy Keane, he'd be in your face shouting, what are you doing? And it, he'd know if you're having a bad game, he, he'd, come on, you're better than that lad, or, you know, he, he just knew how to do it. He was a, a brilliant, brilliant leader, and uh, uh, not only a brilliant leader, but a top class guy as well. Piers, he was an unbelievable defender. He's just exceptional. He was for a centre back. He was so good in the air. He's he's defending a second to none. I knew I could take the chances of going forward because I knew that he was going to going to cover me. But he's been at Rovers. He was at Rovers for years and years and club captain. And he was just exceptional. Sligo is home for me. I, I, I class it as home as well. I obviously moved abroad when I was 15, lived in England for a few years and then came back here and was here for 10, 11 years, you know? So like, I totally understand. I've made some unbelievable friends down here outside of football. Uh, you know, Brian Fox would be one of them. Even when I first came here, you think of like the likes of Caroline Henry across the road. And you're ingrained in it. You know everyone, everyone knows you. You speak to people daily. 
I understood what it, what it meant to people, and so it was myself as well. I was doing for Sligo as well. Uh, even now, coming back, I always love to get down and we'll have a few points and have go to the matches now and just meet up with people. And then, of course, I had my family coming down from Dublin, to, and they see it. My mum and dad love Sligo as well. They're always coming down. Here's Millen. Oh, nice ball into the feet of Kataro. Great play by Raf Kataro. It's there. What a goal. Brilliant ball in. But what a piece of play by Rafa Kataro. The Tubakuri tornado does it again. That first goal for me is probably one of the, the standout moments that I can remember as, as, as a player and probably the best moment I can remember as a player. You know, obviously, uh, there was lovely play. I think Mark Quigley took it down out of the sky. We got good possession of it, moved it across the back. Great ball out to Ross Gaynor. He then passed it into Pascal Millian, who knocked it back again. Went back into Pascal Millian, who knocked it then into me. But I had come in off the far line, kind of what we kind of worked on a little bit in terms of Mark Quigley used to love dropping in as, as a false nine. And I came in off the line and, and, and was a, a second centre forward. And great ball into Pascal, got a nice little turn on it. Stuck it under uh, Ian Birmingham's legs, was in on goal and just didn't really pick a spot, just hit it. And it happened to go under Barry Murphy's legs, you know, and it was a way like celebrating. But for me, definitely the biggest and the most standout uh, moment of, of my career as a, as a Sligo Rovers player. There's such a big crowd, the ball comes to Raf. You see Raf getting the ball, and I guess it's one of those things you're at the match, you can't, you know probably appreciate how good of a goal it is. You see him get the ball, you see him turn, and you see him finish beyond the keeper. Here's the first touch, here's the turn, and he's at the ball quickly. Whoa, what a finish. I probably didn't appreciate it until after the time. What a fantastic goal it was. It was probably one of the best, and given the importance of it as well. Like the skill that he did, the skill that he used to actually score that goal was phenomenal, really. And the finish as well was even better nearly. It must be what dreams are made of that this one opportunity and it's a home ground, home county, biggest crowd of the year to bring the league back and the man to do it was the Tubber Curry Tornado. The only team in the Premier Division that Sligo Rovers haven't beaten so far this season. Gainer's corner, beautiful flick on. Oh, yes! It's a second goal for Sligo. Katara was coming in on the far post, but Piers is getting the credit. The second goal is probably one we've probably worked on that year a couple of times. Um, Piers used to always kind of run to the front post. Um, obviously, we had a signal. One hand was 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 near post area. I remember going up for the second one. And I said to Ross on the way up, I said, "Whip it low to the front post," because I seen a gap uh, on a corner previous, and he turned and I managed to get the flick on. I actually told Raf to start there and spin to the back. So Piers, he's gotten front post, got the little nod on, and there's no one within five or ten yards of me, and I'm at the back post just here, ready to to knock it in, and and did you know? And you're two 0 up in in a packed showgrounds, you know. I remember the, the temporary stand obviously went in and it felt so all closed in that day. It was just perfect. You, like, you, you couldn't have asked for a more perfect setting to, to go and win a league title. So many of us grow up watching support Rovers going to games. For many people, if they got the chance to play, to play one match for, for Sligo Rovers, they come on for a minute, they'd say, Jesus, they, they live the dream, so to speak. I don't think there's many players in, in any level of football who can say they did what Raf did. I definitely thought it was just one of these days that was written in the stars after that. I thought this is it. It's going to be a stroll in the park. We're away. We were all chanting and singing in the stands. It was a carnival atmosphere at that stage. You were just looking around, everybody was bouncing. Everybody was just up in the air. It was amazing. Huge setback for St. Pat's, who'd looked so comfortable in the game up to those last few minutes. Well, Rafa Kataro, what an afternoon for him so far. That's five goals in his last six games. And obviously Sligo Rovers with a two-goal advantage. 
they don't have to push the game too much. They just need to hold what they've got. Brilliant play by Quigley and great movement by Lee Lynch. The streets really. Uh, I'm from Inner City, Dublin, so there was a football park at the Tarmac football pitch like right outside my door. So I was literally used to play with all the men, like much older than me, like when I was eight, nine, ten, we would be playing against 20, 21 year olds, people proper, five side football, intense. You have to have a good touch, you know? So that's where I sort of was bred into me, really, stuff like that. So when I was on the pitch, I felt like I had oceans of space when I was getting the ball in them little positions, because when you're in, in a city playing football and tournaments and stuff like that, it's rough, um, it's physical, they don't care how old you are. If you're on the pitch, you're on the pitch. So I was brought up that way where, Listen, if you have, you can't give the ball away because the, the men will give out you stuff like that. So it was sort of, it, it was just, it was ingrained in me. And at that age, I think I was, when I signed for Sligo, I think I could have been around 25, 26 maybe. So years of that and obviously being in England and playing and just, just that was just me. That was just the type of player I was. Uh, I was never afraid to get on the ball, never hide from it. O'Brien, Fagan and O'Connor standing over this. James Chambers with his back to the Sligo Rovers goal. And it's Fagan who takes it. To be honest with you, I never really worried about anybody that I was playing against. I always backed myself. I knew that I'd be quicker than most people, stronger, good in the air, like, you know. Christy likes to drop in the feet. I knew if I could go in for him, he's not going to pace me in behind, you know. So I backed my own ability and, you know, at the players I had around me as well, like back then. Um, I, I wouldn't really fear anybody going into a game. <laughs> Probably now I do, a little bit older. I don't have that pace anymore. But. So going in at 2-0, I'd rather go in at 2-0 than 2-0 down or nil all. So going in, I felt confident that we were going to go on and win the game. I knew they were going to have spells in the game, stuff like that. But I don't really remember any big speeches during half time. I think uh, the, manager was, the manager was a real calm manager. He wasn't a rant or a raver. So when we went in, I think it was, you know, keep doing what you're doing. We're 2-0 up, keep calm, nothing silly, keep playing your football, stuff like that. There was, there was no... You know, any given Sunday speeches or nothing like that. Not that I remember, I just sat, sat there chilled. Those days of roaring and shouting are pretty much gone. So lads are all very calm. You know, I don't think they're thinking uh, just doing the league. They're just thinking about winning this game. To be honest, I'm not one for roaring and shouting. You've probably seen me here. I, I, I don't get any satisfaction out of shouting at people. or I don't think you learn anything from people shouting at you. So we've got to articulate what we're trying to do here. And at the minute, this is what we're trying to do with our team now. We want them to play well. But we've got to talk and understand what does that mean, you know, the kind of way. So when we get in at halftime, we're 2-0 down. I said, listen, guys, we're going to change a couple of bits and pieces. We like to, we just tactically just minutely changed it. And I remember Stephen Kenny at half time. I was up. I, I was in the press box. It's the only place I could squeeze in. And Stephen Kenny goes, "Oh, he was the then Shamrock Rovers manager. Congrats, Alan. Um, it's great to, to finally win a league title." And I remember turning around and said, "It's not won yet." In 2012, in January, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. So started 12 sessions of chemotherapy in February. Long run went on. The sicker I got, so. Lucky enough, I had a good family around me and a great crew in the, in the hospital. Some of them were Sligo Rover supporters. And they knew how mad I was about the Rovers as well. My wife brought me a season ticket. She always buys me a season ticket. But I was, there was a guy with me, and you through junior football, you know him as well. He didn't have the results that I had, but he still went out and bought a season ticket. That's what people, that's what, the Rovers mean to people. He knew he wasn't going to be there for the end of the season, but he still bought a season ticket. I thought that was unreal. St. Pat's playing into the breeze in the second half, which has freshened just a little bit during the half-time interval. O'Brien sending it up towards Fagan, easily beaten by Pierce. Christy Fagan was the best striker at the time in the league, I think, on the build-up to it. Albeit Mark Quigley got player of the year that year, but Christy Fagan was just was, was brilliant. Um, you can see why he was at Man United. Um, he's hold up play, he's 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 all round, you know, he's finishing and everything. And as you'd expect, Kenna and Brown have gone forward for this free kick. O'Connor chipping it forward. Oh, it's come through to Fagan! Oh yes! They are back in it! That's a sweet strike by Christy Fagan, Pats are back in the game. 
And it's a brilliant finish by Christy Fagan. It falls to him lovely and he just, he plants it in the far corner. There was no stopping it. And I, you could see their tails were up. Their fans, they, they were buzzing then as well. And you know, it was game on. Christy was a smashing player, a uh, really tidy finisher. Like Christy wasn't one to go and beat three or four or five players here and, and score, but he's very technically very good. He could just drift past somebody and score, but uh, he was a great goal scorer for St. Pat's and a, a, a great player, in fairness. You still have the belief you're going to win, but your brain is also telling you, oh, maybe not today, because the momentum changes so much in that regard. You, you do kind of feel like, it's kind of, you're thinking the two conflicting things at the same time. You're both convinced that this is the day that you're going to win the league. There's no way we can lose a league title at home after being 2-0 up. That's not going to happen. But there's also the part of your brain that's maybe conditioned as a Rovers fan, or maybe it's a football thing, but it's also telling you, like, nah, nah. It's too easy. It's too easy to win a game like that and win a title in the showgrounds when, you know, they've scored, they have the momentum now in that regard. And Sligo Rovers will have to hang on unless they can get some more possession. Clumsy challenge by Cawley. Another free kick to St. Pat's, and this one... Very dangerous for Sligo. As was suggested at half time by the lads, did Sligo put too much of a physical effort into the first half? That's a free kick again. And there's plenty forward here. He's curling for the far post, which he strikes with a brilliant strike, Sean O'Connor. That wasn't a cross, that was a shot, and he was so close to putting Pats back on terms. I was very lucky to be involved with Ian Barraclough in the, with, with the winning team. And, that won the league, you know, again, we won another cup, won the Satanta Cup. We're still holders of that, because that's been played since. Uh, and when you see the, what he is going on to be, you know, I mean, it goes to show the stepping stone that he and what he learned here. Sean O'Connor, who struck the post the last time he took a free kick around the Sligo Rovers penalty area. And as you can imagine, Sligo Rovers have 11 players in their own penalty area. Here comes the free kick, taken short to Forrester. That's a good side, it's gone in! Off the defender, I think it was off the head of Ross Gaynor. And St. Pat's are back on terms. What a game here in the showgrounds. Two goals in six minutes. Thought maybe not today, maybe the next day we're going to win it. Yeah, my heart sank. It sank at that moment. I, I thought this was it. I thought this was going to be a typical Sligo Rovers day where it's just everything's handed to you at once and then taken away just as quick. And then all of a sudden, you're thinking, two games have to play after this because you've nearly written this off to a point in your head but then you do look out there at the same time and you know you see the players that are on the pitch and there is that belief that's left that ah you know what it could well be all right still two nil up and then you say oh you know what we're going to make things a little bit interesting it's got to <laughs> but listen uh, some parts fight they fought to come back but we didn't panic that's the one thing when it went 2-2, I think we just went right, reset, and everybody just got back to doing the tactics. It was back and forth, they had great spells of possession, we had, but they were a really, really good side, a really good football side, and they, they were very, very close to us. We obviously just pipped them, but I think without them, it wouldn't be as good a season, or definitely it wouldn't be as good as match as you, as you said. And some space down that far side now for Jay Carroll, who did well to find Ian Birmingham. Piers sliding in, great tackle. Piers, he was a, yeah, he's still a good friend of mine, and we we still catch up and chat, and we we had we had a good last seat. Obviously, he has a sore back from carrying me throughout the years, but uh, yeah, Piers, he was an unbelievable defender. He's just exceptional. He was for a centre back. He was so good in the air. He's he's defending a second to none. I knew I could take the chances of going forward because I knew that he was gonna gonna cover me. But he's been at Rovers. He was at Rovers for years and years, and club captain and he was just exceptional. It's a long time since St. Pat's lost away from home, way back in October 2011, believe it or not. Unbeaten away this season, as are Sligo at home. Myself and my friends love watching uh, Pascal Million play. He used to have lots of skill moves that we kind of admired and tried to replicate in our own training ground, but we actually ended up there was a pitch invasion after the match and we actually ended up with one of his shin guards. Now, I'm not sure is that too great to say, but uh, we definitely championed it around the school afterwards and we met him after the match too and got a picture. So those are things I still kind of hold dear in my football and memories today. I remember obviously his, his, his first goal when he scored in the showground and he's just done this mad flip and a big tumble and we're like, all right, straight away. The moment he did that, fan favourite. 
from then on that was him he was he was sorted everyone just wanted to see him score a goal so he could do his flip but you know great lad in the dressing room really positive lad in a sense he always you know thought that the best of, of, of any outcome was always going to be a good one you know nicely into the feet of Fagan who came deep O'Connor on to Flood who's onside furthest forward for Pats plenty arriving now goes for goal hits the frame of the Upright, what a great effort by Anto Flood. Inches away from putting Pats ahead. Incredible stuff here in the showgrounds. In some point, I think I went out in 75 minutes, something like that. And I can see Jay dictate everything. I can see him, everyone calm. Because that's what we need. We need someone who's going to calm the boys to say, hey, you know what, we're still capable of winning. So we need everyone to be calm. We keep playing our football, keep passing the ball, and then it happens. And now Quigley. Always dangerous for Pats when Quigley has the ball at his feet like this. Super play by him. Great play again by Mark Quigley, who, by the way, keeps holding his hamstring. My hamstring was gone. I pulled my hat like I was struggling. The adrenaline inside, it's, it's too old. I'm still going back to that point where I haven't left my mark on this match yet. The Pats fans are having a go. I'm not coming off after 75 minutes. The game too old and we end up losing 3-2 or someone else gets the pen off, or you know, like stuff like that. So in my mind, I had a feeling that I was, I was meant to, there was something special for me that day, considering the team we were playing against. Quigley, lovely turn past Conor Kenna, who pulls him back. Referee says play on, good refereeing. Here's Dylan, on it goes to Ventre. Quigley's getting into the box and Kenna has to clear behind and that's got the fans behind the goal. Absolutely delirious. Brilliant play by Sligo and yes. great defending too by Pats. They want the insurance of a lead goal and who can blame them? In comes the ball, Pierce with the shot. There was contact against Conor Kenna. I can't believe he's given a corner for that, a, a penalty for that. All you hear is the whistle goal and because it's so far away, you're not really in that moment of what's really happened there. You're instantly thinking, oh, there's been a free out or something. You don't think automatically we've got a penalty because the ref didn't really signal. It was the, uh, the linesman that was the one that actually gave the, the penalty, if I'm not mistaken. And you have that moment of kind of uh, disbelief that we're in the 89th minute and we've got a penalty. Of, I don't really know what we've got a penalty for, but geez, we'll take it, you know? Listen, if it's given against you, you're not going to be happy. We're, we're happy, obviously, because it was given for us. So I'm screaming, Penno. Um, you know, his hands are a little bit outside of, you know, they're not in a natural position. They're outside of his body a little bit. So, you know, he's making his body bigger. For me, the ball's gone for to go, his hands up. There was people around the uh, six yard, they probably could have got a nick, so it's a penalty for me. If you look at it now, this day and age is definitely a penalty. It's got to be the worst penalty ever, but uh, <laughs> leaving that aside, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe at the time. I, the, the game was over anyway, you know, kind of way from a Sligo end of it. Uh, we needed to win. Well, it was unfortunate that it finished that way, but that said, it was a tremendous game. It was a tremendous advert for the league here. They're the sort of things you do dream of as a child, you know, you put the ball down all the FA Cups and, and cut and win the league and you score a penalty or you score a goal in the last minute. So I'm there saying to myself, like, this is your moment to actually like do something and, and leave a mark and, and a bit of history. So that was, yeah, I was really calm. I knew I was going to score. I, knew, I really knew I wasn't one, that I didn't doubt myself for one second. Mark really, he had that confidence. That's the big occasion. All eyes on you. What are you going to do? Like, you have everything in your hands. It's Mark Quigley. Mark Quigley doesn't do nerves. Mark Quigley doesn't flinch at the big moments. When I saw Quigley go and take it, I said, ah, that's it, now we're sound. We had the right man at the right time in the right place. When I look back at it, I didn't realise how long from when the penalty was given till I actually took it, how, how much of a gap it was, where that's the sort of time where you can get nervous, wherever the penalty was given, the ball's put down and you don't have time to think, you take it. I didn't doubt myself for one second. Never doubt myself for one second. I think when stuff like that, when you do start to doubt yourself and you get nervous, your run-up changes or you might change your mind where you're going, but I knew the minute the handball was given, I knew where I was going. I was having the banter with Shani. Uh, Barry Murphy was thinking, I had him perplexed what I was going to do as well. So as you can see on, on the, in the footage and, and everyone else is pa probably panicking around me, but I think deep down the lads knew.
fans afterwards was something I'll never ever forget. He was tailor made for that game. And I think he even remember him talking in an interview after and you know, the interviewer asking him just, you know, was there any nerves and he says, no, this, that's what he lived for. That's what his career was made for, was big moments like that. And you could see it. I think I, I ended up tearing down the jinx down, halfway down the jinx stand, up and down, running around like it was the 100 meters in the Olympics or what. The face was mad, absolutely. that were going through my head was just hang on, just hang on, whatever you have to do at this stage, just hang on. You could see a little bit of nerves creeping into players and temper started praying. It was, a, it was actually a very aggressive end to the game from Danny and that getting sent off. And, you know, which was a downer at that point as well because what came just after the final whistle, like just before it was, it was very, very heated, unfortunately, because it was, for both clubs there was so much on the line. I jumped about four feet up in the air. I, I was so, it was very emotional. It was a very emotional occasion. It was brilliant. All the problems I had just seemed to disappear. I was in ecstasy is the only word I could say. And I looked over and my sister-in-law, the tears were running down her face. And it was the same with a lot of the other people around me. I thought about my granddad, Michael Cairns. He used to be on the committee. He'd be so happy and proud to see us all there winning after 35 years. I broke down because I was standing beside my dad who was there in 77 and he was able to tell me about the emotions of that day as well and all the fans invading the pitch and I was just watching on and seeing our own fans invading the pitch and it was running parallel, it's nearly the same day, repeating itself just a different opposition. For me that was, a, that was an amazing moment to be able to share it with him as well. As a journalism student looking back now I think I can appreciate the gravity of it so much more because Given that Sligo Rovers is a small club in the west of Ireland and the financial backing they have may not be up there with the wealthier clubs or the city clubs in the League of Ireland, um, to have done what they did is a massive achievement. To see all those fans, I, you couldn't see who's richer, who's poor, you know, who's homeless, who's not. They were enjoyed for one thing only. We were waiting for so long. We were waiting for so long and finally it happened and it happened here in the showground. Like, we didn't have to go in in somebody else's stadium. We won it in the showground. And to see that emotion, you know, is... I met Joey after the won it. And I said to Joey, you know something, Joey, you don't realize what you did for me as a person. You know, I said, like, I've had a shocking year with illness. And I said, what you've done, give me such a boost. And he smiled and he said, oh, he started laughing. And he said, thank you very much, he said. I'm born to make you happy. I like that song. <laughs> no, but the, the emotion, you see the, the, the fun, to see the joy in there. That, that, that's, why, that's why I love football. That's why I love football, you know.